Hello and welcome to episode two of the Digital Relics podcast, where every week we share our thoughts on games, movies, music, technology, and politics. I'm your host, Jason Stieber, and I'm joined today by my good friends, Nick Sandelsky. Hey, guys. And Josh Greenwood. Hola. So, how was your week, hey, guys? Good, good. I, I had a good week because I didn't tell you guys this. But I started watching Stranger Things. Oh! Finally! And that was actually before I saw the show notes. And oh, it all worked out really good. That is so good. Yeah. Um, amazing. So I'm excited to talk about that. My week was kind of shitty. Um, but that was by the f- that was based more that I hate living sometimes in, in Wisconsin in the winter. <laughs> Because I uh, I fell like four <laughs> times because of the weather, oh, and so yeah. so I'm, I'm, yeah. kind of, I'm kind of beat up at the moment. But otherwise, I, I'm pretty good. I honestly thought you were about to just say that you hate living sometimes. Yeah, yeah, like, no, just no. leave it at that. Yeah, to our listeners, uh, yeah, we we do live in Wisconsin, and we 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 went through uh, a bit of a of a of an ice storm, and so yeah, um, it was it was difficult to get around. It was a nice mix of just above freezing enough that all the snow melts and then just below freezing enough that it all turns into ice so Great. Uh, you know i'm under the mindset that like wisconsin has some of the most perfect summers and we pay for those perfect summers from really shitty winters that's just me though. yeah it's the yes. price you pay yeah. exactly at least we don't have like cockroaches and alligators and stuff yeah yeah agreed, absolutely. agreed yeah. on that right ice ice won't like search you out and try to kill you like yeah. <laughs> so you play any games or uh, watching any movies, Josh, or anything? Uh, well, I, like this weekend, I've been playing. I've been playing a lot of the For Honor the Beta. It's just like, oh, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it, but I also have my fears with it all along the same route. But I really that's like probably the biggest kind of game I've been playing this week so far. So great. Is that is that online only, or does it have a single player portion as well? I it does have a storyline, and I. I all I've seen so far is the multiplayer because obviously it's the beta, but they do say that there's a storyline, so I'm assuming there's a single player game. Okay. I don't know how they would do that with a multiplayer game, but I guess for viewers that are unfamiliar, if you just say what the game's all about, kind of. Uh it's it's a, a massive multiplayer. There's like three factions. There's a samurai faction, a, a knight faction, and a viking faction. Um they what I've seen so far is they take advantage of three classic multiplayer modes deathmatch um single combat like one-on-one and then there's like a, a, do- a domination which is capture of the flags okay um so far i've been really impressed my biggest fear with the game is i fear that it could possibly run into situ- uh, situations that like games like titanfall ran into um with just carried over uh people keep playing the game that's what I worry about. Oh, just game. keeping a consistent user base? Yeah, I mean, that's like... And then, like, the big problem I had playing it was, like, I, I had such a hard time getting into modes, like, like with a... Which could be just a thing with a beta. You know, it just kept knocking me out, so... Mm. So so is the, the combat melee only, or is there, like, a ranged element to it? Well, like, the three factions, they all have, like, they have, like, right now, as I've seen so far, is there's, like, a... There's, like, a sword, like, weapon, and then there's, like, a longer weapon... And then there's like, like, for example, like the knight has, there's a knight, I got then there's a knight with a, a mace, and then there's like an assassin. So, oh, okay. I, I mean, well, the, the samurai that you showed in me that in that one trailer, and the samurai had that long staff. Yeah, and it's I'm not sure what it's being called, but like it's it's the fighting comes to the fact that you're it's you have to really like each guy fights differently, so you right. can't assume like the same thing will work with every guy. The thing that really has impressed me the most is the domination mode, which is like you get five heroes, which you play a hero, and you it's five players, and then like there's like a like a hundred AIs running around, so it's like a battlefield, oh, and you just you try to capture flags, and you go to a thousand, and then like the losing right. the losing faction will like end up like retreating because it's like a battle. That was right. the most impressive to me. Um, so yeah, like I said, like the thing that worries me the most about the game right now is like if they're going to be able to keep fans, because I think you run you run into that problem with any multiplayer mm-hmm. game. Well, you know that just gives a incentive for the developer to to really deliver a quality experience to keep players coming back. You know, I think I go back to the the vision. You know, when we started that last <laughs> what spring? Yeah, or, and. 
you know that was well, it was it, it was a game that was hyped up yes that, that people that, you know to get people to play and you know, once you get into that the the experience and it it, it slowly it slowly lost all of us mm -hmm. and uh to be fair, it hasn't pulled any of us back in, but mm -hmm. from what I've read and what I understand about The Division is they have been um, amazing with post-release content. Mm -hmm. um, the game's apparently a totally different game <clears throat> than it was when we played it. Mm -hmm. And actually, their user base is at an all-time high right now. Really? Yeah, yeah so well, it's, it's definitely had a resurgence. Right. The yeah. newest mode they added, I don't remember what it's called, but it's essentially... Um, all the players are putting a one server inside of the city, and it's during the night of a giant horrific snowstorm okay. uh, to the point that your visibility is like only 10 feet in front of you and it they pretty much uh, turn it more like a a, a day z or h1z one type of game where it's almost a survival game mm -hmm. so you need to um go near uh fire barrels every so often or you will freeze to death mm. you need to have pieces of cloth that you find around the map to wrap around your wounds or you'll bleed if you get shot oh, so it's more about survival and everybody's trying to get to this pickup point i think where they're taken out of out of the zone but mm -hmm. apparently it's really good and it's it's really uh, brought a lot of attraction back you know, to the game i'll have to uh, check that out again i feel like more and more this is new to this generation of games you're seeing games that are like this a lot that mm. are released and they're <clears throat> only mediocre or they don't have enough content and then over mm -hmm. time uh more and more content is added and the game changes fundamentally and it brings in new users you could mm -hmm. say the same thing with destiny mm -hmm. destiny at launch is a completely different game than it is mm -hmm. today and and their whole um you know post-release content schedule is every three to six months they release a huge expansion and everybody comes back in and plays it for a month and then it kind of dies off again and then over and over and over again i think i think a neat thing that the the for, the for honor game does is like when you select a faction for example if i, I selected the knights i i don't I, you can play still play as everyone though like I, if i selected the knights faction i can still play as samurais mm -hmm. i can still play as vikings and i also think that they also incorporated this idea where the factions will fight each other so, like, after a certain amount of period, that faction will, like, conquer the land. And after that happens, like, the land changes. And, like, and they, they've also encompassed, like, a seasonal thing, which, I mean, I, I have high hopes, but, you know, high hopes don't do very much for you sometimes. Well, it definitely sounds like a unique take, for yeah. sure. All I can say is when you showed me that trailer the other day, I, I was impressed. Right. It's, it's, and it's very difficult. I mean, like, right. you have to be patient. That's the biggest thing with the game. It's like if you mm -hmm. run into this, you're going to get killed really fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't take just pure luck yeah. to be successful. You actually you have to have some skill, which is it's, which we don't see a lot of that in games anymore. Huh? That's my opinion. It, I liked, like, when I was playing the Domination Factory, it reminded me of, like, the... Uh, the Iliad, you know, because there's like a battle going on around you, but then there's like a single, like, one on one fight with a hero, which is another player. Oh, cool, and then cool. they could be unique, and like, you, and like, there's a, with the battles too, you could be like, you could be really sucking, but if you like change how you're fighting and your stance, you can easily come back, and the, and the battles are really intense. Well, from what I've understood about the game, is um, the hype levels weren't really there, uh, maybe even a, a couple weeks ago even. But uh, ever since this beta came out, people are, are really excited. I'm hearing a lot more word about it. So well, that makes it sounds like there's a lot of good impressions. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I think that's – like when I'm in the in the beta, there's like – it says like when you're going into the modes, like low activity or high activity. So I do think that there – I thought there was like little no knowledge about the game. So I agree with that comment that you just said. Mm -hmm. A little bit about my week. Um, I had an excellent week as far uh, as visual entertainment goes. I uh, watched a new show that I wasn't excited about before I decided to watch it, but I was surprised that it, it got really excellent reviews. It's the highest reviewed show of 2017 so far, and it's uh, a show on FX called Legion. Mm. I don't know if you guys are familiar at all. There were some Super Bowl ads for it. Uh, Legion is technically uh, an X-Men property, but you would never know it from the first episode, at least for the first 80% of the first episode. It, to me, is exactly the shot in the arm the superhero genre needed. It's it's very, very different. Um, it's experimental, it's dark, uh, it's funny, and it's really weird. And it's very ambitious. It's different. It's nothing like any um, superhero um, or X-Men property you've ever seen. Um, it's very unafraid to be different. Um so who stars in that? Uh, it's mostly unknowns, as far as at least as far as I understand. I, I I haven't heard of the main actor. 
um, the guy who plays Legion. I think his name is Dan Stevens, but I will say that the person that I did recognize in it is Aubrey Plaza from Parks and Recreation, okay. but she doesn't play a comedic role. Um, so pretty much the setup of the of the show is um, the opening shot is essentially of a, a child being born, and they do these cuts, and within a matter of three minutes, you see a child being born all the way up to a grown person, and the abuse that this person went through, and the trauma, and you find out that he... He has issues with paranoid schizophrenia, and he ends up being put into an asylum. So it leads up to this point where he's in an asylum. He's heavily medicated. He's fully convinced that he's a crazy person. Um, he believe he hears voices. He sees that he sees things, but they also show these brief cuts of him making a room. <laughs> Sounds like President Trump or, <laughs> <laughs> or things like that. So um, the way it's shot is very. Um, it reminds me of Terry Gilliam, who did 12 Monkeys. So he does a lot of that slant cam, kind of weird, dreamlike, mm -hmm. otherworldly feel to it. And it's really kind of Terry Gilliam meets Kubrick, which is um, kind of crazy to say. But uh, his use of color and set design, there's a lot of symmetry and there's a lot of um, like diffused colors and, and like a softness to the picture that gives the whole thing this really cool dreamlike um feel to it mm -hmm. uh but anyway the entire episode is pretty much about him dealing with the fact that he's crazy and he um aubrey plaza is another uh, person in the asylum and, and she's also kind of crazy but then a girl comes in and she's an attractive girl and uh, mm -hmm. he immediately has uh, an interest in her and the first thing you find about her is she doesn't like to be touched so she's got a real sensitivity to being touched um <clears throat> and she introduces this whole philosophical point of view to him that essentially says like who who who's to say the voices aren't real who's to say you're crazy who's to say you're not normal what is normal uh and it gets him rolling in a completely different direction they end up um having a relationship within the asylum and they fall in love um but she still can't be touched by him and she ends up being approved to leave the asylum um supposedly healed but he has to stay there and in one last desperate attempt to say bye to her, he runs to her and, and kisses her. And I'll just, without giving too many spoilers, a major event happens. Mm -hmm. And um, he suddenly wakes up and he's in what you think is another medical room, but you don't know how or why. And he's being interviewed about what happened, who is this girl, um, all about the event. And they tell him that this girl that he was dating for months um, on the show was not in any records. She didn't exist. Um, so uh, he starts questioning whether he's sane again. Anyway, it leads, without getting too much into spoilers, it leads to a really good conclusion, and I, I just couldn't rec recommend it enough. It's it's my top show of the year so far, and I cannot wait to watch episode two. My only concern is that episode one was so experimental and so good and so different in that it didn't really feel like a superhero show mm -hmm. that I really hope season or episode two can keep up with that standard because as he discovers what he is and as more mutants are discovered which i think is inevitable in the show um you you worry a little bit about it turning into more of a traditional comic book property again but so far it's incredible i, I think both you guys would love it it's right up your alley because it's a lot of sci-fi it's a lot of philosophy it's dark it's well acted well written well directed mm -hmm. great music so highly yeah. recommended yeah um shows movies that that really try to en engage the the audience and, and make them f really feel what the character is feeling like question reality mm -hmm. question you know, different scenarios that the that the, the actors are going through the characters are going through that that really defines the the difference between a good show and a bad show so yeah. Yeah, i'll definitely have to check that out yeah it's honestly it's the best new show of 2017 for yeah. me i would put it above westworld even it's great wow it's very yeah good. yeah westworld is you know i think it's up there. I, I, i'll even further what you're saying i think that's it I think that's so true with movies, what you just said. Yeah. But I also think that's so true with video games. I mean, like, I think popular video games, you, you end up, like, loving or enjoying just, like, going through the same thing the hero is going through. So it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I've seen previews to that show every because uh, I watch Taboo all the time with Tom Hardy. So they always have a preview of that show. So, yeah, I'll have to check that out. What do you think of Aubrey Plaza as an actress? I don't know. We never really talked about her. I I actually hadn't seen her in anything other than Parks and Rec until right. this. Loved her in Parks and Rec, although she was kind of a one-dimensional character. Yeah. 
in this, she's awesome. I was really, really surprised by how good she yeah, was. Yeah, I yeah because watching her in Parks and Rec, it makes me yeah, it makes you think that she is only a one dimensional actress because yeah. she's one, so one dimensional. She just hates everybody and 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 she's in love with one person and that's it. That's all that matters. And I think she she has probably a certain range. Yeah. Because you could still see that it's it's Aubrey Plaza, and mm -hmm. she's got a little bit of that sarcastic wit about her, and she's yeah. witty and and well spoken and stuff. But mm -hmm. it's a it's a different take, and it's yeah. it's more serious. Well, that's great. Yeah. Good for her. Yeah, definitely check it out. Yeah. So continuing on my cinematic journey this week, uh, well, my Keanu Reeves <laughs> extrav extravaganza continues. Yes. Um, so it started with the Matrix trilogy, followed by Constantine, followed by John Wick One, which I love. John Wick One, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. it's a great movie. Followed by um, seeing John Wick John Wick Two in theaters this weekend. Ah, tell us about it. We need a drum roll. I want to hear. Yeah. I want to hear, hear what he thinks. <laughs> the best action movie I've seen since Mad Max. Oh, oh man! Without hesitation. Does it? Does it top Mad Max? It it's doesn't top Mad Max yeah. in my book, but it's damn close, and it definitely tops John Wick 1. Yeah. Wow. I know you guys haven't seen it, so I'm going to uh, lay, lay low on spoilers, but I will say that um, I would say the only piece of John Wick 2 that doesn't reach the heights of the original is the core piece of the plot that essentially gets the ball rolling. So the reason that he's killing people isn't as... Emotional or Keanu Reeves or, doesn't need a reason. To kill people. Sorry, <laughs> in real life, he's, other yeah, people, exactly. Yeah. Like he's. I thought you were gonna say Keanu Reeves doesn't need emotion. Yeah, <laughs> you can do whatever the hell Keanu. Reeves I would wants sacrifice to do. anybody for. Yeah, me. <laughs> my family. Sorry. Yeah, go for it. Keanu. Yeah, exactly. Do what Keanu you gotta Reeves, do. he can have. That must be why he you. looks so youthful. All the time. Yeah, he just yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um. So yeah, that's the only part. But but again, how can you really beat the first one where? Uh, spoiler if you haven't seen the first one but be, before the events of the film uh, he is a world class assassin he's known as the boogeyman he is feared by all and he ends up retiring because he falls in love finds a wife that he marries and she dies you don't really find out how mm -hmm. in the first film but she, really she dies and he's yeah. heartbroken um, and like his last gift from her was a puppy and about days or maybe a week after he di or she dies, <clears throat> um, these little punks break into his house, beat the shit out of him, kill his puppy, and steal his car. And that sets into motion the events of the first one where he comes back and he kills everybody. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah it, it's awesome. It, you really can't beat a premise for a movie. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah. So the second one is less um, involving in that it's essentially... Um, he took a blood oath. He hit. He, he took a blood oath um, to get out of the business. Originally, that um, if he if they he if he was ever needed, they would call him back. This mm -hmm. with with this one guy who's very powerful. Anyway, this guy asks him to come back. He doesn't want to. Breaks the blood oath, which is a huge no no in in the reality of the film. And so the guy does a bunch of shit that fucks with John Wick, and John Wick comes back, essentially. To get revenge and mm -hmm. also to help the guy so it's a whole thing but um the, the the biggest thing that was really impressive about the film was that it takes the lore and mythology and world building that was kind of touched upon in the first one like how all of his currency were these gold coins and how he had the nickname of the boogeyman and there's that weird otherworldly hotel where like it seems like this hotel houses mm -hmm. assassins right so it takes all of that subtle world building and it just rolls with it in the best way possible. So that hotel returns, and then you find out there's an entire worldwide network of assassins, and you find out um, like this weird system. And again, I don't want to get too, into too many details, but it creates its its whole world, and it's and it's really fun and amazing and unique. And it's it's not it's not a world that you've seen in other movies. It's it's really cool. It's got it's got a very very um, unique feel to it. Uh, and then also they they really they were not pulling any punches for the sequel. They wanted to improve it in every way, and it's clear the fight choreography, as good as the first one was, the second one, it just, they they do long shots of of Keanu, and and you can tell they purposely try to make it his face as clear as possible to show that he's doing all of it. And they'll do a shot for 
three, four, five minutes of just him kicking ass <laughs> and just the level of choreography and even just the energy levels for Keanu, who's in his 50s now. Yeah. What he's able to do, it's uh, it's just a delight to watch. There's a, there's a scene involving a room full of rotating mirrors. That's one of the most beautifully shot scenes I've ever seen in a movie. There's neon lights everywhere, and it's this gigantic room with these rotating walls and mirrors, and there's and there's gunfights going on, and oh, it's incredible. It's really yes. good. So I think what the sequel really did is it took took the concept of John Wick and it really elevated it into a class that wants to compete with James Bond and with Mission Impossible and Jason Bourne, all those type of spy movies but I, I honestly I think it's superior to any of those it's you awesome it's a I mean, 9 out of 10 you think easily. this is a start of a new IP like going forward well you know I think the issue is that Keanu is in his 50s mm -hmm. so I think it can only go so far and I think this is not the type of franchise like Bond where you could just replace the actor replace, and still yeah. call him John Wick yeah. so with that said I expect without any spoilers I would say I, I would expect a th I would expect a third one personally so yeah. that's interesting so another very high recommendation. Uh -huh. And I'm not sure if you guys like the original John Wick as much as I did. I, just the original was like a 7.5 or an 8 for me. It was super fun and it was unique. And, it, and the action choreography was really good and you love Keanu. So it was really good. But this I is a whole different level. Anything um, with Keanu Reeves, man. Oh. Yeah. And I will say that Rotten Tomatoes backs it up. It's a ninety-one percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah, I, I really like the uh, the fighting style in the first one. I think a lot of I think a lot of action movies tend to like go too fast. This movie moved at a really good good uh, speed and allowed you to see like what the hell was going on instead of having like six or seven guys running on the screen. Well, just think about that. How how difficult it is to make a good action movie because they yeah they can just throw people on a set and. I mean, and not have any sort of direction. Well, I think they... when it comes to that, choreography is really important because choreography can really break a movie because you, you can... Really... I mean, it's one of the easiest things to do is see a guy standing behind whoever is in the movie scene and just waiting for his turn. Yeah, come absolutely. And get, come and get his arm broken. Right, it's like, okay, now you enter and, <laughs> and we'll punch you in the face. And yeah. I'm very sensitive to that, too. Um for example, Christopher Nolan, as great of a director as he is, I don't know if you've guys seen the clips out on the internet of The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises. You will laugh your ass off. Like, okay. I mean, there's seriously dudes like just standing in the background, like <laughs> just wiggling their knees. And then, seriously, it's it's funny. And, and now I've noticed it as I actually watch the movie, too. Yeah. But Batman just kind of like looks at him and he's like, oh, and he falls over. Like, yeah. terrible. Yeah. Really bad. Yeah. Nice you, you see that really a lot in the, in the third film with like the Bane one where like the cops and the criminals run at each other. Towards the end, yeah, yeah man, you, that is like one of the worst like like scenes in the movie. Yeah. Where like, so like you I just, can notice it in real time. That's bad. It's like like I just saw a guy like with like a machine gun, and he like just takes it and throws it. Like, <laughs> I don't do this anymore. <laughs> Let's just fist fight. <laughs> well, I think it's very insightful that you pointed out how good the fight choreography is in John Wick, because. In the, the original John Wick was the first movie by this director. John Wick 2 is the second, so he's only done these two movies. Mm -hmm. But prior than that, he was, he's was he been in the industry for over 15 years as a stunt coordinator. That's what ah. he's done for his entire career. So I'm just looking at some of the work he's done, and he you could tell he was the stunt coordinator to go to when he was doing that type of work. He did The Matrix. He did The Matrix 2 and 3. He did the Spider-Man movies. He did Constantine. He did Mr. and Mrs. Smith. He did V for Vendetta. He did 300. Whoa. He did Rambo. He did um, several X-Men movies, several Marvel properties, uh, the Hunger Games, the Sherlock Holmes movies, which have great fight choreography too. So yeah. you can tell he all that experience led up to John Wick. And I think that's the reason that those fight scenes are such a, a source of clear pride when you watch the movies because that's probably his in his wheelhouse that's mm. what he's best at so yeah, absolutely. and like i said chapter two takes it to a different level well that's exciting yeah interesting so very 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 good so the super bowl mm. did you guys watch the super bowl you know i well I had work the morning after the super bowl so i watched okay i, I told myself i would watch until halftime well the falcons were up what 21 to nothing at halftime something or 21 like that, to 3 yeah. something like that i'm like okay they were playing phenomenal patriots were playing like garbage 
I'm like, I'm okay. I think it's safe to say I can go to bed and... and like, go Falcons. I'll, yeah, I'll wake up. And yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I wanted to see the Falcons win, obviously, because, what, first time, second time and... First, they've never won a Super Bowl. They've never, the second time they've been to the Super Bowl, yes. right? Yeah, so, yeah, so anyway, okay, I'll go to bed and wake up and I'll see the Falcons have won. Well, I wake up for work the next morning and um, no, that's not the case, so... A victory for white America, just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. So yeah, I, I uh, after watching the highlights of the second half, I was amazed. Yeah, I texted my dad when they when the Falcons went up twenty eight to three, saying Falcons were clearly the team of destiny this year. Nothing's going to stop them. <laughs> right after I texted him, everything changed immediately. It was um, yeah, so yeah. It, I think it was a, it was a mix of the Patriots doing making no mistakes to make that comeback happen, and it was also. It, it, I, they were down twenty-eight to three, going you know late in the third quarter. They could have done everything right for the rest of the game and still easily lost. They needed help from the Falcons. They needed the Falcons to fuck up, and the Falcons did. Um, there was some bad play calling on offense on that drive. Everybody's talking about it. Where it was second and one, they decided to pass. Matt Ryan took a sack, got knocked out of field goal range. Then it was third and eleven. They decided to pass again. There was a holding call, and then a chip shot field goal turned into a punt. And really, the difference, if they would have went up 31 to 10 or whatever the score was at that point, that game would have been over. But instead, that laid the, down the whole path for the Patriots to come back and win. Um, with that said, I'm not a fan of Tom Brady. I think he's an excellent athlete. I'm just personally not a fan of him. But I, I think you can't argue that he's the best of all time now. Hey, man. The dude has more Super Bowls than any quarterback that's ever played the exactly. game. Exactly. I think you can look at minute statistics over his career, but... Simple matter of the fact is, yeah, he has five Super Bowl rings. So I disagree, but that's. His <laughs> <laughs> I still think Joe Montana is the greatest quarterback I ever played, or a greatest player. Well, if we're calling him by position or player, I mean Charles Haley. He has five Super Bowl rings. Do I think he's the greatest defensive player that ever played? No, I don't. When you compare him, Tom Brady is five and two in the Super Bowl. He beat quarterbacks like Jake Delhomme, which we all know he's in the Hall of Fame. He beat he beat an injured Donovan McNabb. Now, when I um, when I think of Joe Montana, he's won four Super Bowls. He hasn't won as many as Tom Brady. Yes, I'll give you that. But let's look at the people he's beat in the Super Bowl. He's beat Dan Marino in the Super Bowl. He's beat John Elway in the Super Bowl. He beat a guy named Ken Anderson for the Cincinnati Bengals, who was the MVP at the time. And one, he's never thrown an interception in the Super Bowl. Unlike Tom Brady. Yeah, that's definitely very impressive. And I, I mean, somebody as good as Joe Montana, it's, it's hard to argue against him, too. Um, and actually, Joe Montana was was interviewed just a few days ago asking if he thought Brady was the greatest of all time, and he wouldn't say it. He wouldn't agree. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, say <laughs> that. I will say, I will say this. He's in the top two. You can't yeah. say that. those two guys are hard, are hard to debate, and obviously the time period is a big thing. I, mean, I disagree with you on a couple grounds uh, because, well – Charles Haley, a defensive end or whatever position he was, played a lot of different positions. is not a quarterback. Yeah. A quarterback carries a team. If you win Super Bowls as a quarterback, it's because you're a great quarterback. But well, that's my thing. Is like, and beyond I, that, Tom Brady has the stats to reflect it. He's got some of the greatest stats in the I, history of the and NFL. And that's my well. thing. Is I, I think like when I compare Montana and Brady, is I think that, yeah, it's, he's been to seven Super Bowls. You can't deny that fact. But I also don't think that he was the main reason why they went to those Super Bowls. I still don't think that. I think that... I think I, I and I'm making this argument to say that they have the great. I think they have the greatest coach of all time, which I mean. And I'm not a fan of Bill Belichick either, but you can't argue it. Right? Yeah, yeah. When you're, I mean, just imagine your thought process when you're going into the late third quarter, fourth quarter. You're down by that many points, and to keep your head in the yeah. game. That's like all that, coaching, and that's veteran absolutely. leadership for sure. Yeah, absolutely. We should say he's the greatest player right now. <laughs> yeah. Until Aaron Rodgers exactly. wins another six yeah. Super Bowls in the next six years and yeah. changes the whole narrative. But, so we're so, not a sports podcast, so we're just going to keep it brief on that part. So we will move forward, but um, we'll have to agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk just a little bit about the Super Bowl and um, the ads that were in the Super Bowl uh, that relate to this podcast. So movie ads, technology ads, etc. So I'm just going to go down the list here. Uh, Gardens of the Galaxy Volume 2. What do you guys think? I'm excited. I'm so excited. I love I love that IP. I love the actors. I love the storyline. I love the well, the universe that's been created. So I, I am mean, super excited for that. I didn't see that during the Super Bowl, but I, I have seen the trailer to the second one. And I am I, I agree with everything Nick said. I, I mean, great story. 
So, yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, um, there was some pre-screenings done of Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, and uh, every movie that gets a pre-screening gets a, a rating from the viewership. I'm not sure the technicalities of how the rating works. But I will say um, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is the only Marvel property that's ever tested um, at 100. Wow. That so, makes me so happy to hear that. Yeah, so that's very impressive. Um, All-time classics like even Forrest Gump and uh, Argo and other movies tested 88, 91, that range. So it's really rare. I, mean, I guess that? it's very rare for a movie to test 100 with an audience. So You know, you bring that up, I was... Um, today I was actually watching videos that they've already started putting trailers out for the new Avengers Affinity movie. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, it wasn't actually a trailer. It was just kind of um, but like they, some they of the early footage. Yeah, mixing the characters from that Guardians with the, the Marvel characters. I yeah, uh, Avengers. The, the next Avenger movies are going to have every character from every film somehow incorporated into it. It's all going to tie together now. Wow. So it's, it's going to be a huge undertaking. <laughs> It's going to be either really good or really bad. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be tough, but I will say it's directed by um, their brothers, the Russo brothers, and they're the ones who did um, Captain America Civil War and Captain, Captain America Winter Soldier, which I think are two of the best movies yeah, in the, in the Marvel canon, so that's that's good as well. So did you guys see the new um, Pirates of the Caribbean yeah, trailer? Yeah, I I showed that too. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not a big Pirates of the Caribbean fan but i think that movie looks really good i think that story is really interesting too yeah i'm, I'm still up in the air i guess yeah I, I, i'm i lean towards towards josh's feelings I, I watched the first pirates of the caribbean but after that it not so much um but yeah i I, yeah. I mean, I'll definitely give it a shot. It's so, like, you know, if Disney's backing it, they're going to put a lot of money behind it. So I'm going to be a lot more critical on it because if it's not done well, if anything is not done well, I'm going to be critical because Disney has the money to do anything really well. But other than that, I, I've been willing to give it a chance. Yeah. And I like that time period. I love the whole ship sailing, you know, like, I just love that time period. I just don't want to see the rehashed... Uh, formula. Oh yeah, we'll just throw old Johnny Depp out there, pretend he's drunk, and and we'll, we'll just have him like somehow miraculously make it through every situation. <laughs> you just don't want to see Orlando Bloom again. Yeah, no, I love Orlando Bloom. <laughs> yeah, uh, we all saw his penis. Yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> okay, I, not I, yeah, I, you know, you asked me, have I googled his penis? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> who has it? That's my wallpaper. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> the really zoomed in. <laughs> yeah. We call it Google this penis. <laughs> yeah. You You're not an American if you haven't Googled Orlando Bloom. Yeah, Bloom's right, penis. yeah. If you don't Google Orlando Bloom at least once a month, something's wrong with you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I'm kind of, I guess, in between both of you guys in that I thought the trailer was great. And I love Javier Bardem. And I think he looks like an awesome villain. I love the special effects they did with his, with his face. It also doesn't look like a movie that you want to take kids to the way the, the other ones were. Oh, yeah, it's, it's scary. Absolutely. Yeah. I wouldn't want my daughter to see it right now. With that said, I, I think this could be the classic um, bait and switch trailer. I just I, I could see the trailer making the movie look a lot cooler than it ends up being. What it ends up coming down to is does it actually have a good plot? And ever since the first Pirates movie, I don't think any of them have no, had good plot. Totally and they've agree. all had the budget that Josh is talking yeah. about. Yeah, so, I agree, I agree yeah. Well. You can throw as much money at, in an IP as you like. It doesn't mean it's going to turn out well. I guess the only thing that can bring a little bit of optimism is there has been such a gap between films, so you'd hope that they've given time to polish a good script and, mm -hmm. and all the pieces fall when into place. When is that place. supposed to come out? Sometime this year, but I don't know. When no, if, it's, if it's not complex, I think a lot of movies run into problems with having these really complex like trailers. It doesn't have to be complex. Yeah. I mean, go back to, to John Wick. Yeah, I mean that's I mean, what I'm that, saying. I, I rather than like if you if you take out all the extra bull crap with it, like you make it just like you know you streamline the story. Right. I mean it's it like, doesn't it, have to be complex. Yeah. I mean there there are plenty of 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 uh, opportunities that show that that that's the case. I think the most important aspect of of these types of movies, these big action movies, is that you can relate and feel for the characters. Right. That's really all that matters. There doesn't need to be a million things going on. You pointed out with John Wick. Right off the bat, you care for him because Absolutely. his wife just died and his dog just exactly. got killed. So you're like, you yeah, kill these him. motherfuckers. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. That, I think that was maybe appealing with the first uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Like you, you kind of you connected with Jack Sparrow. Okay? Yeah, because he's like, kind of a fuck up, and he wants to be this great pirate. Right. But he's never been quite that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you, you yeah you had this emotional bond with him, and and yeah, they just in subsequent films they just 
Neither yeah, the focus in the subsequent, subsequent films turns into surprise betrayals and Orlando right. Bloom lied and this right. and that. And then it's like, who do we even root for? Like, we just want to see your penis! <laughs> Come on. Enough already. Yeah, no. Let's quit fucking around. <laughs> I'm not wrong in saying this, but like, could you say that the first one was more centered around Orlando Bloom and the, the rest of the movie started to like to, to encompass Johnny Depp as the central character? Yeah, clearly Disney reacted to the stardom of Johnny Depp right. and how uh, iconic that role of, of Jack Sparrow turned. Absolutely. And, and then they focused on him as the main character, where I think his strength was as a supporting character yep. who could throw in that funny line here and there or they took know, advantage of that connection that he had with the audience and they just take they took it over the top and it went too far so to put it this way i hope it's good but i would i wouldn't be surprised at all if it was a flop yeah yeah but, i have no i have no uh, expectations that's like the film. exact same way i would describe that yeah movie. definitely <laughs> so uh, the next trailer, probably my favorite of all of the Super Bowl, is Stranger Things 2. Now, Nick, I know you're not finished with season one of it's, Stranger I'm Things. I'm three episodes in. I know. I'm, oh, I'm you're sorry. only three episodes in. I'm okay. sorry, audience. I'm behind the, the, the times. I'm catching up. So did, did you catch the trailer of Stranger Things 2? I did not. Okay, that's probably a good thing. Probably. We probably won't talk too in-depth about it then right. because it would have spoilers from the first season. But uh, I will say it looks awesome. It, it looks like a direct continuation it's still harping on that nostalgia really well, and it just reminds me of my childhood just watching the trailer. And um, I think it's also become clear that the budget has been upped. Uh, Stranger Things was a bit of a, a risk for Netflix, and I don't think they had a ton of a budget behind it originally, but that thing blew up overnight. You know, I was thinking about that as I was watching that. I probably should, should have done a little research on the budget, but man, I was impressed. Yeah, what they were able to what do with were, what must have been a relatively small budget right. is really impressive. Yeah, because I mean, there's a little bit of of a 3D effects, you know, it, mm -hmm. within the series from what I've seen so far. And But, but uh, you know, it's like uh, just sprinkling it within the, with the within the series, I mean, they've done a phenomenal job. So Yeah, yeah. and I will say, Nick, if you're three episodes in and you're really enjoying it, you're going to love it because the show just continues to go on that trajectory and it gets better and better and better until the very last minute. Yeah. I had, well, let's just say, I started it last night and I watched three episodes in a row. <laughs> I had to stop, like, I literally had to force myself to stop watching. Like, and it's got such a great Spielberg, oh, yeah, classic I, Amblin Entertainment type feel to it. It reminds yes. me of E.T. or Close yeah, Encounters. Exactly. It's got such a great classic feel yeah, to I, it. I thought of Super 8. Too. And I thought it really I thought took it what it. Super 8 tried to do to the next level. I think it's the yeah. Yeah. To Super 8. What's the name of the bomb in that movie? Uh, um, the act, the, like the, the Disney boy I'm talking about. Forgot her name. But yeah, uh, you know, it, uh, Winona Ryder. Winona Ryder. That's, Winona Winona Ryder. Ryder. that's the reason why I watched it originally. And I yeah, I'm a fan of her. Really revitalized her career, I thought. So yeah. I haven't seen her in much in a long time. True. She was. She played um, Spock's mom in Star Trek, the new Star Trek. <laughs> And that's it. She died like a yeah. 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Sorry, Winona Ryder. Yeah. That's all we can give you. We know you're listening. Yeah. We love you. We love you, Winona. We love you. No, yeah. Uh, boy, those three, the three kids, you know, they, they, uh, spoilers if you haven't watched it, but yeah, they, you know, they're, when they're looking for, what was his name? Willis or Will or I can't remember. Where the hell Willis. is Willis? Willis. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I you talking about Willis? Just, just those three those three characters, those actors are phenomenal for their age. Yeah. And the, the the connection that they have, this, the, the on-screen chemistry between them is phenomenal. Like, you would, like, it, that show literally takes you out of reality and puts you into their... Yeah, environment. very true. Uh, it, it puts you into that era, too. It puts that, yeah, it puts you in that era. Like, I, and I was like, you're le legitimately fearful for them. In, in, the, in that scenario, it's just, I, I'm just blown away, blown away by it. And once again, going back to what we talked to about John Wick and Pirates is that right off the bat, they make the characters relatable and they make you care about them. Oh, I yeah, love absolutely. that they're they're kind of um, geeks, they're really. Geeks, yeah, yeah. They, they love their uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, yeah, First episode, Dungeons and Dragons. And they're kind of outcasts in school. Yeah, and, um, yeah but they, they have each other's backs. And, and it, you're right, it is amazing the performances they put in because they're, first of all, they're child actors, and second of all, they're unknowns. So that's amazing cast. Did you ever feel like that in high school when you were in the, were you, weren't you in the AV club in high school? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not really. I've, yeah, we're, we're, we're fortunate. You, what did you do in high school? Where'd you want to go? Oh yes, I wasn't. Well, I, no, I worked in IT, oh. and I, I did some AV club things. <laughs> that's Come on, the, theater kids are the best kids. That, that's the '90s version of IT. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
So next up is Life, which is actually a movie I hadn't heard of prior to the Super Bowl. Uh, Ryan Reynolds. Who else is Jake Gyllenhaal in? I don't. Yeah, yeah Jake, Jake Gyllenhaal. I'm another sure. another sci-fi film. Uh, I guess I'll let you guys take the reins on this one. Josh. Oh, I I well I. I, I think it reminds me of Aliens. That's like the first thing that came to my head when I first saw it. Um, and I think it's got two like really strong male actors that are up and coming. Well, I don't know if you want to call them up and coming, but they're, I think, the future, of obviously, future stars. Um, I think, I don't know. I, from the trailer, like I, I feel like it could be another like bait and hook type movie where... I just hope it's not like another Passengers not that I exactly. thought Passengers was going to be good, but I could see that happening. Well, and, and, and honestly, I haven't watched Passengers, but I was more excited for that trailer than I was for Life, which doesn't give me <laughs> a lot of hope for Life. Really? You were more excited yeah. for Yeah. See, I was never excited for Passengers. Really? Well, well, well I, can tell guys, you, I just have a bias for the actors. And I love I love Chris Pratt and Jennifer Lawrence, but I just the ham-fisted romance right, out, right in the trailer. That's true. Like, oh, yeah, God, that's it's true. Yeah. Like, usually, yeah, usually the trailer tries to hide that. Yeah. And then they, it's like Twilight in space. It looks <laughs> like. You know, and I think when you think about it, I think you're going to see a really good performance from both. Like, I think it's going to be, to me, from what I've seen in the trailer, I think there's going to be a standoff between Chill and All and uh, Ryan Reynolds. And I think that's what I think that's what really helped the movie Aliens itself, the, the original. It's like that being, being in that, like, like, can you trust the people you're in space with? Because when something crazy like that happens, can you trust them to have? I mean, you could put that even on, like, a, on Earth. I mean, can we trust our neighbors if a biological contagion comes out? I mean, I would say what you're talking about is really a universal plot element that can work across genres, which yeah. is which is a, a, so a good seen, thing. Seen this movie more as a first contact movie. Well, well that too. Well, I, I, immediately, and I think this is intentional. There was a, a part in the trailer where they actually used a soundbite from. Well, it probably wasn't from Alien, but it was very similar. It was like the yeah. that thing, and. I think it's it really seems like a modern take on Alien because it's a bunch of dudes in a spaceship who discover this alien life form. They don't know whether it's benevolent or evil, and shit starts happening. I mean, it's obviously at a very basic level, it's similar to Alien in concept. Mm -hmm. I don't think it looked as good as the original Alien, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've got my selection of first contact movies that I that I really hold to a high standard. Well, contact. Contact, well, Arrival. Is, that, is Contact, is that Jory Foster? Yeah. Okay. And Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, an alien. But a Carl Sagan novel adaptation. Yeah. 2001. Yeah. Space Odyssey. I mean, well, I, mean, they, I don't know. Like, these, these, you, they, I mean, this, put, this movie Life is got, is, it's going to have but a But you hell can't put like, Contact and, and 2000 Space on the same category. This movie is more like horror slash thriller. Yeah. This, again, I would relate this more to Alien than on yeah, uh, Contact. Yeah. Because yeah. Like, yeah. It's, they're not pulling any punches. They're telling you that, like, I mean, I believe the trailer shows the one guy getting stuck. Yeah. Around. Absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't. Um, I don't look at this as a movie that's going to blow my mind intellectually no, or anything. Right. So, and I don't think that's what it wants to be. So, I think you're right, Josh. That would be unfair to even try to compare it to a 2001 or yeah. something like that because well, that's what what it's trying to be. The but, question is, or the the statement should be is: Do this movie is this movie going to try to be intellectual? You know, is it is it trying to is it, is it going to try to be intellectual, but it fails intellectually, and then it, it fails as a movie? As long as it, as long as it, it knows personally that, That's that true. It, it, it's going I to be I think, movie. That you, I think that it's going to be made or bro, bro by the main two characters in the movie. I mean, I have really high hopes. You know what? I hate saying this, but Ryan Reynolds was just like nominated for Best Actor for Deadpool, which is probably not like I would ever put in the top ranks of any type of movie. So I mean, that's true. They are bringing off their games. I mean, Jake Gyllenhaal's always been in strong movies. The thing with Ryan Reynolds and I love Deadpool is that if there was ever a born to play role, it was Ryan Reynolds in Deadpool. He pretty that's much true. plays a, a more extreme version of himself. So I think the question remains whether or not he can expand into other genres and other characters mm -hmm. and still bring that type of performance. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Stay tuned for a review. Yes. Okay, uh, Nintendo Switch commercial. Should we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. yeah so that was also uh, aired at the Super Bowl. And I thought it was actually really funny because, and this is a, a little bit of a meme that's going around on the internet, is they have an infographic showing the score of the game and how Atlanta kept going up and up and up and it hit 
And then the Nintendo Switch <laughs> ad aired. And honestly, right after the ad aired, the whole game switched. Switched. And the game changed. And, and, and uh, the Patriots won. So yes. I thought that was funny. Anyway, we talked a little about the ad last week. Yeah, it was good. Just as excellent as we mentioned. Uh, it reminds me of a Google ad or iPhone ad. It's mm-hmm. modernized. The person looks cool. It portrays without any narrative instantly what the machine's all about so really good ad still really excited for the switch i think it was only a positive yeah it, yeah it just makes me more hopeful because it is i mean obviously a different direction that nintendo is taking compared to yeah. the wii u and the wii in just in just in the the demographics that show up in the ad, and you have guys that are our age, they're you know they're getting up on a roof and they're playing with their friends yeah. or whatever, they're taking it somewhere. That's what I found uh, is actually all of the marketing behind behind the Switch so far hasn't showcased children at all. Yeah, absolutely, which yeah. is a huge change for Nintendo. Right. Or well, I mean, there were some kids in the ad, but I mean, they showed up towards the end. Right, they're in there. But right, it wasn't exclusive, exclusively built around yes, around yes. kids. So I, I love the idea. I love cool. the idea that it, it was shown during the Super Bowl. <laughs> that's, no, that's, that's, just, that's just great. I, that's just great uh, marketing. And I think that shows you right there that how seriously they're taking it. Yeah, and, and they you know, expect the switch to be a success. They're right, not, and you, you look at the pulse of the internet, and a, I mean, I'm not I'm not sure how good of, of a of a person I am to gauge the pulse of the internet, but the internet seemed pretty accepting of the ad, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it seems pretty freaking excited, which is when you which think, is good for Nintendo. When you think about it, too, a lot. I don't know about you guys, but I, I, when I the people I've talked to said the ads that were around during the Super Bowl were kind of like not as good as they've been in the last couple of years. So it's good to see, and it's good to see the Nintendo is exploiting the fact that. But make the NFL sell your product for you. I mean, that's the way you do it. You know, the people are going to be watching it, and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the fact that they're going after some of that market that watches uh, football is well, you really think, how many, what do Now, you Nintendo, think, back it up. What do, you think, it up what, do you, what do you think the age group is watching the Super Bowl? I mean, yeah, it's situation. probably 25 to 35 is what I would guess. And those are all people who have probably yeah. all played Nint- like Nintendo. Grew products. up on those Nintendo, are, yes. Yeah, and those are people that show up in the ad. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, yeah. brilliant. I think, I, I think brilliant. the hype continues on an upward trajectory, and I, yeah. I think it's going to continue that way over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a... Busy yeah, launch. We're only, we're not that far away. What are we, three weeks we're away? We're three weeks away. Less than <laughs> three weeks away. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, tough. Lis- listeners, uh, Jason and I have pre ordered the Nintendo Switch that we plan on. And we will going, be doing, yes, doing we will be doing a midnight launch. We'll be doing extensive coverage yeah, of extensive our impressions coverage of the of Switch once we've picked it up. Absolutely. So, yeah, look forward to that. And I'd like to keep talking about Nintendo and that. Um, Apparently, they are trying to portray the idea that they're now striving to make their online infrastructure and online gameplay, um, quote, valuable. Yeah. So which, that, which is not something it's ever been, to be right, honest. Right. So they, I mean, they, that was one of the first things that they, they introduced was, hey, that they're, you will have to pay for the service. What is it? Like six, similar to Xbox and PlayStation. Well, they, early leaks have suggested, which is a good sign, um, that... While the PlayStation and Xbox charge sixty annually for their online service, yeah, the year, the Japanese pricing for the Switch have come out and it translates roughly to thirty dollars a year. That's that's fantastic. That would so be fantastic. That's a much better rate, especially. I don't think the expectation is there that Nintendo is going to match Sony or Microsoft because mm-hmm. they don't. They probably don't have the, um, you know the workforce in place right. the, the the mines in place to really create that type of a, a an certainly ecosystem don't have the infrastructure in place yes so i think huge. i think what you expect out of a nintendo console is if they can get voice chat working okay if they can get a friends list working okay if they can get a market that works well and then just reliable online gameplay mm-hmm. i think it's worth the 30 dollars right yeah. there and then of course the free game which they have already announced that like playstation plus or xbox live gold which give you two game two free games um, a month, Nintendo will be giving you one game a month, and it'll be the beauty of Nintendo is they've got such a back catalog. So yeah, absolutely. More the so, is there. yeah, more so than PlayStation or Xbox. Right. There's AAA, some of the best titles ever yeah. made that they can be releasing. Content, month. content that people want to continue to play. I mean, they, people are willing. Nintendo, if you're listening, people are willing to to pay a, a yearly fee 
you know, if you give them these Easter eggs, the, mm-hmm. these games to play every month, I mean, people you know, will do it. Xbox, no doubt. Xbox has been getting better at that. They they give all, like they have the free game, two free games every month, and they also give you like discounts on games right. for every month. Um, occasionally, they'll have a really good game on that list, but most of the time, they're just independent games that are not. And I see. I see as well that Nintendo is. Uh, they're going to have a mobile app. You will be able to. Uh, chat with your friends. And yeah, and there's might... been a little bit of criticism behind that in that apparently that mobile app is required for the, the voice chat functionality. Uh... So it's not actually a built-in app on the system. A lot of people are up in arms about it. I think it does kind of come across as half-baked, but at the same time, if it works well, everybody has a smartphone. I don't. I think right. it's. A, I think it's a non-issue as long as it works well. Yeah, so. you might alienate a few people, maybe the younger, the younger generation, True. maybe, but. But I'm not going to complain if there's, you know, no 12-year-old saying they want to fuck my mom. Yeah. You know, so I'll be fine with that. So we'll see. Also, me personally, just personally speaking, I don't really usually buy Nintendo systems to play online. No. So I'm not all that concerned about it. Yeah. But at the same time, you look at games like Mario Kart 8, which can have like 16 simultaneously play- players, and even Splatoon 2. Um, the potential is definitely there for a good right. online system. I haven't done that for years. Like, I, like if I'm online. I'm talking to what, like, four people that I know. It's not like yeah. I, I, I do not want to go online and listen to somebody else talk. Very true. Yeah, is it, I mean, the main focus should be you have you have a list of the friends that you want to communicate with, that you want to play with, and that it's simple to to, to send an invitation and and start playing a game with them, and that's. It, it, in in reality, it's not. It shouldn't be that hard of a system to set up for Nintendo. So if they, hopefully, they can pull it off because they can only really go up from from where they're at right now. Yeah, and you can't make everybody happy either. You know, no matter what, you well, absolutely, you're always going to have somebody's going to complain about something. Yeah, absolutely, no doubt. So I'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, a new recurring mini segment that we're introducing that we like to call predictions. Uh, predictions is a segment where we predict the Rotten Tomatoes rating for films coming out the following week, as well as the Open Critic rating for games coming out that re- week. Uh, if you're not familiar with Rotten Tomatoes or Open Critic, they are both um, sites that act as an aggregate for professional reviews across the internet and um, they take an average of those review scores and they post them on their site. So an excellent film on Rotten Tomatoes would get a 90 plus Rotten Tomatoes rating. Um, a poor film would be you know, 30, 40, 50 or less. So with that said, um, we're gonna be taking a running total of who predicts what each week and we will have team Greenwood, Team Sandowski, and Team Stever, and we will uh, keep track of the scores each and every week, and we will update every week on who wins, who loses, and uh, the, the scores as they change. <laughs> so for the first week, we are predicting two films, the two biggest openings of next week. The first one being The Great Wall. Have you guys heard of The Great Wall? Yes. I had a... <laughs> well, as, <laughs> as you know... Um, the Great Wall is an action fantasy film starring Matt Damon. That's the fantasy. And it does not seem like like the type of a film that Matt Damon would usually star in. I, I do know that a lot of the funding came from China, so it's one of the first um, big-budget Chinese films to be showing up in the U.S., Anyway, yeah, so Matt Damon stars in it. We're not going to go in-depth on our analysis of it, but if you guys just want to give some some predictions on a Rotten Tomatoes score, and I will take note here. Josh, go ahead. I've got my score. So we're going like out of 10, right? No, it's going to be a prediction of the Rotten Tomatoes score. So out of 100%. 100%. My first prediction, 31%. Ooh. Ooh. That's close to mine. I've, you know, I've, I've seen a few of the trailers, and... There is not anything I've seen about this movie that I think is very good at all. Um, I'm not going to give it as low a score as Rings guy has right now, which is, I believe is five percent. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I think Matt Damon. You, you got to give the, the main actor some credit. So thirty one percent is my guess. Yeah, um, I I was thinking thirty five percent actually. That was the number I had in my head. Uh, I think Matt Damon 
will be the shining point of that movie. He's uh, he's a good actor. He's fun to watch. He'll he can take whatever script he has and try to make the best of it. Um, but I think the movie is going to be extremely one dimensional and and uh, it's going to be a complete, uh, almost a complete. Film. I, love, I like how I like uh, they become a movie trying to explain. So explain something that that's in our world like the great wall why it's there we know why it's there. <laughs> yeah <laughs> we don't need a story to try to tell us let's, yeah right. let's just make a movie about it <laughs> yeah i think we're all on the same page on this one i'm, I'm guessing 38 percent for the same reason you guys pointed out um of course it's an it's a january february movie which never usually bodes well the trailers have looked really bad the only reason i even have it as high as 38 percent is because of matt damon because he's usually not in terrible movies but this looks like it could be a terrible movie <laughs> i would not be surprised if it was half I, of 38 percent. i but. would get, i would give it a higher rating if the monster in the movie didn't look like somebody's iguana they flushed down the toilet that deformed itself <laughs> <laughs> so the next movie up is A Cure for Wellness, which is a psychological horror thriller directed by Gore Verbinski, who actually directed the original Pirates of the Caribbean, and then he also directed uh, Weatherman, starring Nicolas Cage. So he's a, he's a solid director. It stars Dane Dehan, who um, was in The Amazing Spider-Man, and then he also, his breakout role was in um, Chronicle, which is like a, a sci-fi superhero coming of age film it wasn't very good yeah it was okay uh, but anyway it's pretty much about um a, a guy played by dane dehan who goes to a rehabilitation center where he's supposed to be made better but then you find out something nefarious is going on and it's kind of creepy and weird so predictions for a cure for wellness josh uh i'm gonna say 51 percent Okay. I've seen. Gee, I, you and I think just like me. I've seen the uh, trailers to this movie. Uh, the shots are really interesting. Uh, it looks interesting, but I think that the, I think the movie's going to run into problems with the plot. I think, I think they, that's my probably why I think it's going to be lower. I think the plot is going to bring it down. Nick, I am again really close to Josh, and I I figured sixty uh, percent because. Now this director has done some good movies. He's done Rango. He's done The Ring. He's done The Weatherman, which I absolutely love. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, I, I think it certainly looks ambitious, and it looks like it's not afraid to be different and weird, which is always a positive. I think this is going to be one of those films that's destined to be a cult classic. Or maybe not even a cult classic, but at least a cult film where it has a, a, a small and loyal group of followers who just love the film. With that said, I think it does look like it has a lot of flaws. And I think Gore Verbinski has shown a lot of talent, but he's also traditionally very up and down as a director. Because along with the original Pirates and um, Rango and The Weatherman, he did do Pirates 2 and 3, and he did do um, The Lone Ranger. He's, he's done I some think, other I duds. I think Nick, you just said The Ring, which I don't think is that great movie. I mean, I mean that's the thing. Yeah, I think no, The Ring no, is good. I, I like it. Was, I think that movie was underrated. Is that movie? My... Is that movie? Excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, is that movie that we're reviewing? Is that a horror film? Is that considered? It's a considered horror? a psychological thriller. I gotcha. So it's probably not a straight out horror, yeah. but with some scary elements. So with that said, I'm going to predict 47. percent I'm just like really optimistic with this movie. You're well, the, opti you're the yeah, optimistic member of the exactly, group. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And those are the two big movies coming out. Um, as for games, the the two big games coming out this week, or I should say next week, are uh, first of all, it's a game that Josh spoke about earlier, and that's For Honor. So Josh, prediction for oh, the... This is, is this out of 100% too? So this is the open critic score, and they also do it out of 100. It's not a percent, but it's it's okay. uh, out of 100. Um, I'm going to say 80, 80. A solid 80%. Yeah, uh, I think there's a lot, I've seen a lot of really good things. Um, I guess my biggest fear is, is, is replayability from a lot of people um, and keeping... That people like invested in the game because the one thing you run into with a multiplayer game is there's a lot of multiplayer games out there so you have to do something way better to keep people playing and so that's why i say 80 percent until i see the full game yeah and you probably have the best input on what you think the score of the game is going to be considered you're the only one who played it so yeah, yeah I'm, uh judging from the trailer that i saw and the content um that I've that I've watched, I'm gonna give that game a seventy percent. I think I think it might be a little bit disappointing um, at first, uh, 
I, but I think it, overall it will depend on on how the developers approach uh, the players' uh, critiques after it comes out. Because that, that, that is, and that's just the world we live in now, is where games are released and and developers really have to go off of uh, of uh, requests that that players yeah feedback really from want. the from the gamers yeah, yeah. It, 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 I mean the the debate whether you like that concept that that concept or not is ir- is really irrelevant it's just the world we live in so uh, I think the seventy percent is, no. is I think more, I, it's either gonna be it's either gonna be it's either gonna be really good and like Overwatch really good or it's gonna be really I don't want to say this is bad because I don't necessarily think Titanfall is bad but it. I feel like Titanfall is the game that you have to compare it to when it comes to like a, a multiplayer game that looked really cool but didn't turn out to be. I think one, of, really one of the things that, that things that really hurts uh, for Honor is is from the demos that that we've watched and the gameplay videos that we watched is it's all the same. You're you, I mean, really, like the core concept, like you just you fight, you you fight someone one on one over and over again. So I, how well, can see, that that's, not? That isn't what all of it is, though. Okay, all right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. I land in between you guys on my score. I'm guessing 76% or 76, I should say. Uh, I think it's comparable to games like, um, just from what I've seen, Destiny and The Division, in that I think the game that is released day one may be very well half-baked, maybe lacking some features. I think the fact that they do have a single-player portion, but they've kind of... uh, refuse to market around it tells you that the single player portion might leave a lot to be desired which could, could affect review scores as well uh, I could see just like the division and just like destiny this game being a different game than it is today um, if we were to take a look at it a year from now so with that said uh, day one I'm predicting a 76 let's hope for the best exactly. yeah disappoint. yeah I, I always root for any new game to succeed so hopefully it's good the next game is, um, it's kind of one of those B-movie equivalents of a game. It's actually the fourth entry in the series, and it's called Sniper Elite 4. And what Sniper Elite 4 is, it's a third-person tactical shooter stealth video game that pretty much completely relies on um, sniping and setting up that perfect shot and getting in position and, and taking out targets, um, you know, elite bureaucrats or whatever it might be. So, Sniper Elite 4. Nick, what do you think? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. This this uh, this genre is so beat into the ground. I, I have no expectations. I am not enthused at all. Uh, I'll play Battlefield if I want to play something th- like this, so I give this game a 30%. Wow. <laughs> sorry. I'm, that, I mean, that's a little bit of bias, but... Uh, I I don't know. Battlefield uh, is amazing, and I, le- and I really enjoy playing that. And and I don't want to play anything else. So <laughs> sorry, sorry, Sniper Elite Four team. <laughs> They're listening. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Josh, what do you think? I am going to give it a ninety-five percent. <laughs> oh, wait. Uh, I, I have played. I have. Pl- I have played uh, the pr- uh, the previous version of this game. It is not a battlefield type game. Um, it has a very interesting single player mode. Um, it's ch- uh, the game I played was very cheap, worth spending, and the graphics aren't usually that bad. Um, it, it has a lot more of like a. It, ha- it relies heavily on that slow motion shot. Which is like, something you need to do for a sniper game, but that's my prediction. So I hope I'm right. <laughs> yeah, if it does, if it does reach a 95, though, probably be one of the highest reviewed games of the entire year. <laughs> so I mean, we, this hope, is we hope you're right, Josh. I'm gonna. I haven't played any of the games. They've never really interested me. But it does have kind of a small following that loves the series. Uh, with that said, traditionally these games rate right along um, somewhere in the low 70s. So. I'm just going to keep going right along, along that path, and I'll give it a 74. <laughs> Nick, Nick, Nick's review was so a- angry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an insane range. 30 Nick, 95 Josh, 74 Jason. Yeah, That's a... yeah I don't know. It's, man, there is definitely some Wait, bias. Being, uh, so oh, somebody's going to be really wrong there. Yeah, exactly. Wait, before, I fin- before I finish it, what? do you know how much that game is being priced for? It, it is. I don't know the exact price, but it is being promoted as more of a budget game. So probably thirty to forty. Yeah. So that's why I stick with it. I think it's worth what you're paying for. I think that's fair. Because I think I, when I bought Sniper, I, I, I think it's a third one. It was only twenty bucks. So 
I, I got what I paid for. So I, uh, I've got a little segment I'd like to talk about. I'd, I'd like to address um, the demise of the 3D platformer over the last decade to decade, decade and a half and whether or not a resurgence uh, is on the way. Uh, for those who aren't big gamers, uh, a 3D platformer is essentially um, a game, usually in the third person point of view, where you can control a character and the main focus of the gameplay is platforming. So jumping from different cliff sides or platforms or whatever it may be, and um, kind of figuring, figuring out how to navigate the environment that way. Some of the most classic plat 3D platformers are Super Mario 64 and really all of the 3D Mario games, Super Mario Galaxy, etc. Uh, Banjo Kazooie, um, Spyro that, the Dragon. Is that a game that you're going across the screen? Well, it's it's three dimensional. So if you think Mario 64, it's it's third person and yeah, yeah, it's like an adventure. Um, Crash Bandicoot, Ratchet and Clank, those type of games. So the 360 PS3 generation really didn't see anything as far as 3D platforming goes, which is a disappointment because it's actually one of my favorite genres. It's well, I thought wasn't Ratchet and Clank the new for the PlayStation this year? Wasn't that like looked at as one of the better games this year? Yes, and I play. It was actually last year, but and I played it and I thought yeah, it was like terrific. It. I thought that was the kind of the first. Um, uh, indication of a return to form of this genre. So uh, Ratchet and Clank was one of the highest reviewed games this year. It came to PS4. Again, um, the whole genre kind of went stagnant on PS3 and 360. And I think Ratchet and Clank was the first sign that we saw. Uh, there's also a game called Ukulele, which is being developed by uh, much of the original uh, employees of a company called Rare. And Rare is the company that made Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie and Conker's Bad Fur Day. Um, they actually made uh, a classic GoldenEye 007 as well. That's not a platformer, but they perfect were... Perfect Dark. Yeah, Perfect Dark. Uh, Jet Force Gemini. They were an, one of the very top uh, development teams in the industry in their prime. Microsoft bought them after the Nintendo 64 PlayStation 1 generation. And really a half to two thirds of the whole team left at that point. So Rare was really only Rare by name at that point. <laughs> and the games that they've made since then haven't been great. But anyway, a lot of the core development um, employees of the original Rare has come together um, to create a new company called Playtonic. And they're creating a game called Ukulele, which as it looks exactly like a next generation version of Banjo-Kazooie. So it looks really ambitious. It was actually crowdfunded. It's uh, independently made. It's going to be coming to PS4, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, and PC. Looks really fun, really good. Uh, and then you add that along that. Uh, obviously, there's Super Mario Odyssey, which I talked about last week on the podcast, is kind of Nintendo's return to form to the traditional 3D platformer, whereas with the Wii U, they kind of went with 3D World, which was a three-dimensional game, but it, it, kind of on a 2D uh, landscape, so it wasn't a traditional 3D platformer. Um, then there's also a new Sonic game um, that looks to have a, a much higher budget than past Sonic games, and it's going to harken back to its roots and refocus on 3D platforming. And then there's also a uh, um, Crash Bandicoot um, remake, uh, where they're remaking the three games, three original games of the PlayStation 1, for PlayStation, PlayStation 4 with uh, entirely new Entirely new engine, completely new graphics, looks really fun, looks really faithful to the original. So I'm hoping uh, and expecting that um, 2017 will mark the return of the 3D platformer. Any thoughts, guys? What, do you have any history with 3D platformers, or is, are you interested in the genre? That, that makes me really excited, because I, I love Sonic. I think that's a great game. I, it's a game I used to play on Sega Genesis all the time. Yes, um, I have... Yeah. Um, I think it, hearing that makes it's sad to me that like games like that don't get enough attention. I think it, it's interesting when you think about like the, the time period we're living in, where people are more like there's these games that keep me <clears throat> these games that are made every year and they get repeated and they're kind of generic. So it's it's good to see that like some classic good storyline um, games we played as kids are coming back on. I mean, I love like <laughs> I love Sonic and I love Crash Bandicoot. So I'm, I'm happy to hear all that. I don't, I don't think it's got any more. You have fond memories of playing uh, Sonic on Sega Genesis and, and Mario, Super Mario, and uh, 64, and and uh, and yeah, and, and, and up to fast forward to Ratchet and Clank, and uh, those that genre is 
it's up there in my favorite my favorite genre of video games. So I, I obviously I want to see the I want to see every year the comeback of yeah, yeah. of the three D platformer. Uh, I wish yeah I wish developers uh, they I wish they invested more heavily into into the genre. Well, they're um, they're unique games, and I'm like I just like we get this recycled garbage all the time, and then you get these unique games that don't get enough attention. You know, it just bugs me. So I'm I'm glad to hear that. It's also good to know that Ratchet and Clank was very successful last year's, and I, I kind of looked at that as uh, Sony maybe testing the waters to see if there was still a marketplace for 3D platformers because uh, it was a a remake rather than an entirely new game. Um, so since then, obviously, they've now announced the Crash Bandicoot remake, which I think is a direct response to the success of Ratchet Clank. Didn't he get voted, Clank. Ratchet Clank had voted, like, it made a, it, made, it, it made a lot of lists for the for yeah. Game of the Year, for sure. And I also fully expect to see a, a fully new Ratchet Clank game coming in the future, I, too. You now. know, I'd really like to see Nintendo branch out a little bit more in, in the 3D platformer range. I mean, they got, uh, they got Mario Odyssey uh, coming out for Switch, but... I don't know. I, just feel, I feel like that's always been that's always been a, a highlight of Nintendo is that ability to to bring out a you know bring out that the, the success in that in that genre and, and it'd be it'd be really nice from, from a gamer standpoint to see uh, to see them expand. I do think, I, th I really think it's an untapped market. I really do. I think you have a lot of people that focus on maybe like horror action. Um, Multiplayer game, multiplayer games. Um, I think it's an untapped market. I think a lot of people could take advantage of stories that we've never even heard about. So, yeah, and I'd also like to say uh, the level of hardware that we have nowadays compared to the N sixty four PS one days. Um, again, three sixty PS three generation, you kind of lost that genre, so you didn't get to see those beautiful, bright. Um, neon colors and these worlds so it'll be cool with this level of hardware to see Pixar style visuals mm -hmm. uh, Ratchet and Clank was absolutely beautiful it looks like an animated film come to life so very excited yeah it's not only it's not only that the graphics but it's it's the gameplay style of of what of, you know what you need to accomplish in the games the puzzles and and that I guess like for me being a, a little bit opinionated, uh, that's <laughs> that's that's what I like in in the games that I play. I like I like a challenge uh, to figure out what you know. How do I get to from step A to, to step B? And and is it creative? It isn't it, you know? And, and getting to that point, um, and 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 I'm a gamer where I, I like to explore, and that's something that 3D platformers really yeah. bring to the table. So. Uh, that's what I've always loved about Mario. It brings you back to your childhood. I remember playing mm -hmm. as a kid as like the Sonic man. Yeah, it, yeah. So yeah, there's obviously. I mean, we obviously have a little bit of nostalgia uh, baked into our into our views. And I so. feel, I feel like over the years, as as games have evolved and graphics have become more of a focus, and even the gaming demographic has has risen in age. I think gaming has become much more serious. Gaming has become much more violent. Mm -hmm. Gaming has become darker and grittier. So it's nice to see some of these games returning that harken back to the whimsical, colorful, light, playful, optimistic feel of some of these games of our childhood. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of that, that brings us to our next segment, which is optimism. <laughs> I hardly know him. Hey. <laughs> uh, this is a segment where every week... Uh, we try to find and share a positive piece of news, political or otherwise. Um, we know that uh, our world today is a little bit cynical, a little bit negative. So every week we try to bring uh, something to bring a smile to our face. So this week I am talking about an article um, on HPPR.org, which is High Plains Public Radio, uh, which is a subsidiary of NPR. Uh, the article is about wind power, and it's titled Wind Power Reaches the 100,000 Job Milestone, which is a, a really nice number. So I'll, I'll just read a little bit of an excerpt of the article. Uh, it says, the number of jobs supported by the wind industry has cracked the 100,000 mark, according to new data from the U.S. Department of Energy. As Energy Central reports, the milestone means wind power now employs more workers than nuclear, natural gas, coal, or hydroelectric power plants. And one out of every four of those wind workers are employed in the state of Texas. Um, wind doesn't appear to be slowing down either. According to an earlier DOE report, the U.S. could add almost 400,000 more wind jobs in the next 13 years. 
So this kind of uh, adds on to what we talked about a little bit last week in that we tackled solar and discussed how solar now was employing more people than coal, um, natural gas, and, and a few other industries combined. So another good sign for renewable energy, another good sign for um, global warming and climate change. Yeah, this this trend that we're seeing is extremely optimistic, and and it's not slowing down. Uh, you, I mean, why would you want it to slow down for for one? Um, yeah, read read that what you said before about the the jobs, and it's you you gave the list of jobs, the nuclear job. Yeah, it says the the, the milestone means wind power now employs more workers than nuclear, natural gas, coal, or hydroelectric power plants. Yeah, all things that are bad for our our, our, our world we live in. So that's like awesome news. Right, and it it really just it makes the argument um, of the idea that we're going to lose jobs if we move away from coal more and more ridiculous because I think the signs show again time and time again that the jobs are there for renewable resources it takes away an argument from the conservative Republican Party that mm -hmm. that, that takes that argument out of it because if you if, I don't know if you guys watched the RNC that was like the main thing that he hit on is like he kept talking about coal and they would do all these camera shots of the coal members of the industry sitting in the front row so it's good to hear that because I mean, that, it's an argument that needs to be made and not to get too political, but you look at the Trump administration's cabinet, and there are a lot of there. There's a lot of a uh, of a uh, people in within that administration that have connections to the oil and gas industry. So, it, so one could almost make the assumption that there is there is an attack on on their their way of doing business and that and their that attack is the green energy sector and uh when you know to them seeing this uh this inter this optimistic uh uh these optimistic articles that that we consider optimistic uh is not something that they they like to see so um history is truly repeating yourself because hearing you say that it makes me think back before the civil war there was an attack on a way of life's business how they made like slavery was a way of life for the southern part of the country and they looked at the northerners attacking their way of life which is slavery so it's kind of eerie, right. eerie yeah. similarity yeah there. it's it, yeah it, it's it's kind of a it's almost a little bit of a proxy war that that a pro, a hidden proxy war that's being fought um within the elite system uh, within this within our government uh, against the clean the clean energy movement we're seeing that you know with the EPA the attacks on the EPA um, so it's something it's something to be it's a little disturbing but at the same time with the the subsidies that that were introduced through the Obama administration uh, to really push clean energy solutions uh, into a into a bright future uh, are really coming to fruition now um, and 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 uh, you look at at uh, the, the the takes by the, the by uh, e economists uh, that are that are looking into these industries and and they're they're saying that this that this these solutions are not irreversible that we're pushing forward regardless of of the take of the steps that this current administration will take take against against clean energy so so uh, we're so this is something to be extremely uh, I'm excited world. for. Yeah. I'm definitely more optimistic after hearing that, but the thing that bothers me is that we don't actually see that on mainstream media. That needs to be talked about. I mean, yeah. that is that is just another way of filling a hole in an argument, and it should be talked about by more people. So, yeah. And I think that's a whole other discussion we could have for another week, but with that yeah, said, you know, I think it's clear the way media um, has evolved since the creation of the 24-hour news network and CNN and all that is – Everything does revolve around money and uh, capitalism. So, right. yeah. so the media can only respond to its viewership. So, naturally, over time, what are you going to see? You're going to see more bombastic articles. You're going to see more uh, ex uh, exciting things, explosions or terror or diseases or plagues or all these negative things that could happen because it gets the views, because people get excited, people get scared, and they want to tune in. So it's it's harder to focus on something quaint like, 
hundred thousand jobs for wind power. Mm-hmm. Yay! It's yeah. not going to get them the money, unfortunately. So yeah. we, you know, it's important to, um, I guess, seek out alternative methods of, of reading about news, maybe news outlets that aren't solely focused on uh, the bottom dollar. You know, I made that comment to Nick, Nick um, earlier about like the fact that like people don't know who's governing them and who what they're doing around them. They only know that when they do something on social media like insult the American president. I'm referring to the Australian president. You know, it's like we don't hear that, like, what they're doing. We don't know what they're doing and people don't know. I mean, if you ask them who, if you ask them, your neighbors, do you think they would tell you who was in charge of the district? Would they be able to tell you who what they're doing? No. Exactly. Yeah, you, I, I don't hold that against uh, against people. They, uh, we, we, we all have our, uh, enough to worry about in our lives, and we we want to see we want to see success, you know, within our within our life bubbles, I guess. Um, yeah, and you could say, like, we have enough to worry about, but is it really that we have enough to worry about, or, or have we been told that we have a lot to worry about? Right, that's I true. I mean, it's, it's gone from, we've gone from a country where people wanted to fight for their freedoms of a better life, more pay, better health care, to, to a country that's, their freedoms are found in their new refrigerator, their new microwave, their new, mm-hmm. the new, car new, you know, appliance. drone. So, I mean, it's it's important to hear this stuff. It's important to say yeah, that there are people striving for a better tomorrow. So it is a great optimistic article. And I think it's easy to forget with all this divisiveness right now in our, uh, you know, the climate of our culture, um, that in the end, the vast majority of us all want the same thing. And we pretty much want to be able to succeed in our own lives. And we want to live in a country that supports us and that allows us to succeed. And uh, I just think, think that's something to remember. And we all get tied into our different political viewpoints or maybe our different media that we tune into. But in the end, um, I think everybody more or less wants the same thing. Yeah, you know, we're we're so focused on looking at each other's differences versus looking at what we all have in common mm-hmm. and uh and yeah that's why well we said. well yeah, said. that's why we uh that's why we bring you this optimistic uh, article every week yeah. <laughs> and that'll lead us into um the opposite of this optimistic <laughs> article, which is nick being very angry about something yeah so i it. yeah i you know i was uh Leading up to this uh, this discussion right now, I, I was trying to think about how angry I need to be. Yeah, but basically, what I'm angry about is Amy Adams not getting an Oscar nod for her uh, her role in Arrival. Uh, I, I know I can't really discuss Arrival too much because yeah, I I haven't seen it yet. Josh and Nick have Nick. If you could just give a brief synopsis yeah, of what so it's about. It, you know, we were talking about earlier. It's a, it's a first contact movie, and and we and you know we look at and it, it asks uh, some really good questions about how humans interact with each other, and and the role that language plays uh, in in those interactions and. And how important it really is to understand each other. Uh, so it, it's a movie that really that really makes you think, uh, think outside the box, and and which is precisely the reason why that movie uh, got an, an Oscar nod. But that being said, that movie would not have been what it is without Amy Adams. Uh, she she really the character that she played uh louise banks uh it it would not she was able to make the connection with with the the aliens that come that come to earth obviously from if you've if you've watched the trailer Uh, she makes that connection with them that that i don't think would have been would have been possible with any other actress i mean maybe that's a little bit of bias for for amy adams she's been nominated a few times already for a few movies. Uh, I think I actually had the list. Uh, she was nominated for Junebug, Doubt, The Fighter, The Master, uh, American Hustle. Um, she's never won, but but I mean those are all phenomenal movies. Yeah, I think she's one of the greatest actors alive today. Yeah, yeah, under under uh, um, appreciated actresses. Uh, so 
So yeah, I guess uh, what the heck, uh, Oscar people. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 going I, okay, Meryl Streep. She's nominated every single year for something. Like I get it. She's an amazing actress. The movie she's in. She, what is the movie she's in? Meryl Streep. That's a good question. I've got the, actually. I've got the yeah. nomin- well, nominees up, but you know. can just assume she's she's nominated every single year. She's she doesn't win every year, but to me, to be nominated and to win is is really to to take take a movie that would have been okay, take a script that would have been okay, and really just take it to the next level, and really and really take the watcher in. And, and, and absorb them into your universe. And, so, I, and Amy Adams, she 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 did that marvelously in in Arrival. And it's just really disappointing that she she didn't get that nod. And she got she got nominated f- nominated uh, in the Golden Globes. I don't think she did. Yeah, she didn't win, but but I mean, usually that you look at the Golden Globes and you can usually transport that to the Oscars. So. You know, when I didn't see that, I was extremely disappointed. I guess to add on to your argument, I you know I don't want to be say that I don't think that these five women that are nominated don't deserve these nominations. I'm not saying that. I do Definitely. think they deserve these Absolutely. nominations. I also think that I think it's ridiculous that they've only got five people nominated. I think come on, one more person it wouldn't hurt you. Um, and I think there's a lot more people. Like I was just looking at this this movie that Denzel Washington's nominated for Fences. Fences. I think the woman that he co-stars should be nominated for Best Actress. But, but I think that's a shame. But I just think that if we're, we're going to... I mean, why, why do we have to have a limit? I mean, obviously you can't put 85 different people up for nominations. And I, and I right. think that's the whole idea of it. They, they, they want to make it exclusive. And they don't want to water down what it means to be nominated for an Oscar. So but, I think it does make sense that there is there is a, a limit. And no, they have absolutely. to be consistent with that limit. Because it's if you have 15 people one year, it means less to be nominated, in my opinion. But, yeah, yeah, but, but I'm saying, come on, six doesn't hurt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and but, just... Yeah, I mean, Jason has already, you've already pointed this out, how it's not easy for a science fiction movie to be to be nominated for an Oscar. I mean, I'm trying to think back of the last science fiction movie, what, Gravity? I mean, I'd imagine you can count on one hand the amount of science fiction yeah, movies that have been nominated. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or you, could and, say, you could say the same thing about horror movies. How many and, people have been nominated for horror movies? Absolutely. That's absolutely true. And, and the way for that movie to get to that recognition is because of the actors actors and actresses that mm-hmm. they help push that 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 movie up to that point so i'm sorry amy adams should have been nominated so, so here's my question to you if you had to choose if you had to choose let's say i was with the academy and says okay we're going to put her in but you have to choose what person gets kicked out <laughs> who would you pick out of these out of meryl streep it would be meryl streep so because easy. and i don't i think it's strong to say she's overrated because she's she's probably the best actress alive yeah. but with that said you start to feel like she is overrated when you see her year after year after year after year mm-hmm. in a nomination. Many times when the film itself is not good, but she, you know, she's a standout right. role. I will say that the film that she was nominated for this year is Florence Foster Jenkins, which is about um, a woman who dreamed of becoming an opera singer despite having a terrible singing voice. So I'm sure it's a great performance, no mm-hmm. doubt. But we see her enough, so yeah. I, I would definitely wouldn't argue with seeing some some, some other people. Instead of her. Yeah. But uh, I I will come on with you guys. I, if I had to choose one person to get removed, I would remove Natalie Portman because I not against if anything against her, but I just the top the person she's playing, Jackie Kennedy. She's an important person, an historical per, per person, but I don't think I don't know. There's something about that that role bothers me. I'm going to tell you right now, she's the front runner to win it all. Really, her her performance is supposed to be absolutely jaw droppingly amazing. Just saying, I haven't seen uh, it, but this kind of goes into this topic. But what do you guys think of Hollywood's love affair with itself? It seems like it's like kind of you, up its own ass. Yeah, you, you have La La Land that is probably going to take. Take the After two honors. years of the Which Oscars, the white hashtag is about Hollywood and the film industry. Yes. 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 Of the twenty yeah. actors nominated in lead and supporting categories for the twenty seventeen Oscars, Oscars. We'll, we'll, we'll do Oscar we'll predictions in the coming weeks. Even better, yeah, I mean, we can I guess this kind of goes into my categories. 
Dev Patel oh, yeah, and like Mahershala Ali one. are up for Best now Supporting Actor. Viola Davis, Naomi like Harris, and Octavia Spencer were nominated for Best Supporting Actor. And Ruth Nega that and that one Denzel one Washington are up for Lead oh, yeah. Actors and Actor, the respectively. Yeah, exactly. The last so time this many actors of color were nominated kind of was 2007, both Forrest Whitaker and Jennifer... And it wants to give itself awards. So. I think there's truth there, but I am extremely excited to see La La Land. I oh, absolutely. It looks absolutely incredible. Yeah. The, the few trailers I saw, the cinematography and the dance choreography and the set pieces, oh, man, I would not be, I would not be surprised if it, was, if it was my favorite film of the year. Right. Yeah, I think I was... I don't know, was I watching something about that? Like, that director and the writer was well, kind of up and coming. The, like, the director is, wrote and directed one of my favorite movies of all time. And I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just look it up. Trust us, it's a movie. Yeah, try, yeah. it exists. Do not worry. Um, yeah. So, but, okay, I just want to finish my rant. Uh, Amy Adams, I love you. And I would give you Bear an by Oscar. Shelter. <laughs> <laughs> I would craft an Oscar for <laughs> with you. With your bare hands. If, with my bare oh, he hands. Did, uh, he did Whip, Whiplash. Whiplash, yes. Which I think is is just incredible. It has one of the best endings any any movie I've ever I seen. Do, I haven't seen that movie yet. I, I want to see that yeah. movie. I just have a real, you need to see it I yesterday, man. I have a real problem man. with that actor. I have I'm not a fan of Miles Teller either. Uh, I think he's kind of a dickhead in real life. I don't know him, obviously, but just from what I've seen in interviews, he's very arrogant and cocky and full of himself. Watch that movie. It will be one of the... Yeah. It's it's one of the best movies ever made. I do like... Really. I like the, the older guy on that movie a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Mm. Off the top of head. We're really good at this. <laughs> yeah, we... Yeah, well... <laughs> this is why we always like to remind our listeners that we're not professionals and yeah. we don't know what the fuck we're talking about. Uh, his name is J.K. Simmons. Yeah, J.K. Simmons. He is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal. But I would like... I, I'd also like to add on to Arrival and just say that it's directed by um, Dennis Villanueva... I think is how it's pronounced. He did Cesario, which I think is excellent, starring Emily Blunt. And then he did this, and then he's also doing the upcoming Blade Runner 2049. So he looks like a, a director that's definitely up and coming as well. Yeah. Yeah, and after seeing Rival, I am so optimistic for Blade Runner. And Arrival is coming to home video this week, so I'll be watching it uh, in between our podcast episodes, so I will be sure to have my uh, impressions next week. We will have a review, yeah. Um, next up, Josh, I believe you had something to say. I do podcast. have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's why we're here, man. <laughs> what? Uh, oh, well, first off, I want to talk about, like, man, uh, last week I harped on Xbox for not doing enough for their customers. And, man, did I find a great bargain on three video games for $12. I was like, Wow. You don't find this anywhere. It was like going into like Best Buy and finding your two favorite movies packaged together for three dollars each. So I picked up uh, Metro Twenty Thirty Three and the, the the sequel to the game for six dollars. And you know these games aren't new. Obviously, they're they're they were made in two thousand thirteen, um, and they're not the, the best. The game the best I could compare them to would be uh, Half Life. You know, you play a character oh. that doesn't speak. Uh, but you see it through his eyes. Um, it's a straightforward first-person shooter. Um, if I would read both games, I'd say they're about like a seven out of ten. But they're quality games. It has its issues. It's got a, it's it's got a great they've got a great atmosphere. It's uh, based off of a, of a book about um, people living in the subway system in, in Russia after nuclear bombs were built or built dropped. And they, they basically start their own uh, civilization down there. So it's a really pretty game. But but it's like, again, like I said, it's not like the greatest game you play, but it's worth six bucks for two games. I mean, I thought that was worth it. The other game I picked up for six dollars was a game called Deadlight, which takes place in Seattle in 1986. And it's a zombie game, and it's like a, what do you call those games where they run across the screen, I guess it's a side scrolling game. And that game, I've read a lot of reviews on that since I started playing it. A lot of people say it's like nine out of ten game, so I haven't played that one yet. But I mean, oh my god, I, I take my words back. Back at Xbox, thank you for giving us some good deals. Like <laughs> yeah, thank you for listening, Bill yeah, Gates. Yeah, and yeah. We, thank you for hooking Josh up with a good deal. The uh, Digital Relics podcast takes uh, full responsibility for that good deal. <laughs> yes. So, so <laughs> the other the other thing I want to talk about is I watched two I uh, watched two movies um, that I wanted to talk about during the podcast one was called nocturnal Adam, animals which i you know i gave it a nine out of ten which also has amy adams in it um and uh, jake gyllenhaal um uh, was, and it's and it's done by tom ford it's a 
beautiful movie. Like every scene I watched looked like a piece of artwork. Um, I will say, if you guys want watch the movie in, in the next week, the first five minutes of this movie literally are. Pro I don't like saying it this way, but are probably the most uncomfortable I've been watching the first five minutes of any movie. But and the, and to go into Nick's argument about Amy, Amy Adams, she's the main character in the movie, but she's not on the screen the most. Uh, Jake, I mean, it's basically she's reading a book written by Jake Gyllenhaal, and it's and you, so you see Jake Gyllenhaal more than her during the movie. But her performance was the best performance I've seen in that movie. Like she didn't have to be on the screen the most, but her performance was way better than everybody else's in that. Secondly, I would put Jake Gyllenhaal at number two, but. Uh, so definitely worth going out and seeing. Um, just you, just judging from the trailers, it looked very interesting and also looked very surreal and strange. And it, it kind of, even just watching the trailer made me a little bit uncomfortable because there's just like a weird... Believe it, it's a love story. Yeah, and it just seems like really weird and uh, almost pornographic feel to it. It's just got a real sleazy, slimy feel to it, but also kind of dreamlike and weird. Um, it kind of, just from the trailer, I haven't seen it yet, reminded me a lot of David Lynch's work. I don't know if, if you would agree with that at all. Uh, uh, Mulholland Drive or... Uh, yeah, I, I, could, I, could, I could see the comparison. Um, it's, it's not a fast-moving film. It's very deliberate. It's got a good pace to it. Um, I said, obviously, kudos to Jake Gyllenhaal and Amy Adams. They both give all, like, terrific performances. And I, I kind of think, what's his... Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon. I mean, every movie I see him in, he just blows me away. You know, like, way underrated actor that does not get enough attention. So from a, a storytelling point of view, would you say it's more of a an abstract kind of strange story or is it easy to follow does it have like a, a very clear beginning middle and end or is it kind of one of those stranger type of films it's you know it's it's easy to follow but it it does move around so you have to kind of like realize what you're watching and like realize this is her, this is her reading the book this is current this is not current so i mean you have to realize that but i don't think it's hard to follow that um and when I when I gave it I gave it a nine. I think the thing that I took away from it is like the story isn't like fantastic. You're not going to be like going away and saying, "Wow, that story changed my life." But that's that's like the like the only negative I had about it. Other than that, I thought everything in the movie was beautiful. I mean, I it's one of those movies where you don't want to stop it because you want to see what happens. And Man, it's like, like I said, like Amy Adams does not get enough credit, and I totally agree with Nick. I think she should be nominated for an Academy Award, if not for this movie or for Arrival. Um, it, you know, and I, I it, my other topic is that it, like there's so many good female actresses that just do so well that do not get enough credit. Like they, like I've like seen some really strong actresses in the last week. And they can do so much more than a lot of male actors can do. And I, I think that's amazing. And that brings me to my second movie. I watched Snow White, The Huntsman, Winter <laughs> War. <laughs> I like how we started laughing yeah, as soon as you see it. This movie, I, I'm going to say it right now, 5 out of 10. But th it's like if you, the best way I could describe this movie is, you know, sci the sci-fi channel always has these really cheesy fantasy stories they play. This is like that, but it's got the, the most overpaid, or the most, like, it was an expensive cast. <laughs> I mean, Charlie's Theron. Um, Kristen Stewart does not return in this, right? She does not. I was going to get to that. Um, um, Emily Blunt and Jessica Chastain are the three main females in this movie. I'll be honest, the biggest reason I would ever even want to see this movie is because um, Nick Frost is in it. I don't know if you're no yeah. familiar with Nick Frost, but Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, they were in Shaun of the, Shaun of the Dead together and Hot Fuzz. He's the heavy set man, and I think he's awesome. Yeah, so. I, like that's like that was the biggest positive for this movie. It's like if I was if I was like the ruler of the world, right? I would take the guys that wrote the plot to this movie out in the woods and shoot them all in the face <laughs> because it was terrible. <laughs> but the fact is, the cast in this movie pull, pulls a really t terrible plot. Out of the forest, and or out of the out of the mush, or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, Nick Frost. I mean, he's so enjoyable to live, like in the movie. Um, all the women are just fantastic. Um, the guy Thor, the guy that plays Thor, I can't think of his name. He's not bad. I don't Chris mind Hemsworth. him. And I think it's so funny about this movie. Is I think they took all the things that everyone didn't like about the first movie and they got rid of them. 
they, they do talk about Snow White in the movie, but they don't even show her. They show her, like, staring at a mirror. <laughs> like, I mean, it's like, it's just take all the shitty things out of the first one and make a new movie. So it sounds to me that um, the actual movie is terrible, but all the actors are very good. <laughs> it's yeah, really I, mean, it like, yeah. I was, like, blown away when I saw Jessica Chastain in this movie. I'm like, this is a girl that does, like, political movies, you know, Zero Dark Thirty. What is she doing in this movie? Yeah. But, like, I was just... They are so good, and it's like it's amazing to see, like for example, Charlie Theron who can play a, can play a hero and a play a villain just like that, and she's so good. Wow. She is a so I mean, actress. I think the max this movie could ever get is a five, but it's 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 enjoyable. Um, if you could watch this movie for free, I definitely recommend <laughs> you watch it. Um, you will you won't go away being like that was a piece of shit. Well, you might, but. You won't hate yourself for watching it. So. Um, but that's all I gotta say. I mean, I think those two movies. I mean, I thought they were good, and I was debating on what type of movies I'm gonna be watching. Uh, I'm gonna probably watch a, a, a Hacksaw Ridge this upcoming week. Oh, great! So. Look forward to those impressions. Um, I like. I, I have a secret love affair with Mel Gibson as a as a as an artist. I, I was gonna say, I, where was this going? Yeah, I, have to, I have to make sure a I speak A very discreet that. love affair. Yeah, I love it. Mel Gibson as an artist. Anything else related to his personal life, well, that's a different story. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to root for the guy, but it's also hard to deny his talent. So yeah. uh, I look forward to watching Hacksaw Ridge too. That also because nominated. I love Andrew Garfield. I think he's yeah. an excellent actor as well. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that was nominated. Yeah, for it is. It yeah. is. Yeah. We'll talk it's, more about that next week, but it's actually, it does have a... a, a a Christian slant to it. It's it's a pro religious film. So, and Mel Gibson is yes, he's, he's a, a he's a even uh, evangelical Christian. He's making a sequel to The Passion. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't bring that up. Hey, I do. I don't hold that against him. I don't bring that. Don't bring that up in a religious history, history class. Then people just look at you like you're a weirdo. Passion <laughs> two. <laughs> this time Jesus doesn't fuck around. <laughs> it didn't make it to the Bible, but trust me, it happened. <laughs> that's right. Uh, it is now time for the podcast game of the week. Yes! Woo! Every week we choose a podcast game to play. Uh, these games can be completely random and fun, or they can veer more towards the serious side of things. This week we ask, if you were forced to live the rest of your life in any video game reality, which video game would you choose and why? I'm going to start with Nick on this one. Oh, this was so much fun to think about. Uh, and it didn't take me very long either to come up with a with an answer, and that would be Eve Online. <laughs> <laughs> many uh, people, one, many people in real life already live in that world. Yeah, anyway, exactly. So. That's true. That's <laughs> very true. There are a lot of stories of people quitting their jobs, good jobs, to play Eve Online full time. <laughs> but no, uh, for the listeners that are not familiar with Eve Online, it's a massive multiplayer online game where you pilot a spaceship. Um, and you you build up skills to fly to fly ships, and your your main goal is to work with other with other players to control vast amounts of space resources. Um, so there there's a there's a large political undertone to the game where you you, know, you really need to have the skill to to work with one another to accomplish the goal. Uh, there's also a market aspect to the game. Uh, where you can, where it really mimics uh, Wall Street, where you, you really you want you can you can buy stock in within a within a corporation, uh, which would be a group of of players and 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 buying and selling. But uh, but yeah, uh, the game is I, I don't play it anymore because I have a life, <laughs> and if I did play that game, I wouldn't be talking to you right now, or I wouldn't see anybody right now. Um, it's it, it's a game that it. it it's I it, it it's in my top three favorite games I've ever played. It, it has to be uh, it, it, it the way it, it absorbs you. But but yeah, the fact that you can never die, like you basically you you reclone yourself. And why would not why would that not be the game that you would want to live in for the rest of your life? Why if would, you don't if you don't die? Why would that true. not be everyone's? Choice? Yeah, exactly. But the, the fact that is the uh, CCP the 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 developer of that game. Uh, the creativity that went into to uh, designing the ships that you pilot um, and the feel for the, for the ships that you pilot, um, each one is is unique and and each one has a soul. and And if I was stuck in that universe, uh, I would not be mad at all. 
Yeah, and it really sounds like a space sim in every sense of the word. Absolutely, it's a, it's a simulation, which is which why it probably really works very well with the idea of living in it because it's a it's almost like a um, it's an interpretation of real life, really. So. It, it really is, and, and uh, that that's where it gets a little bit dangerous. <laughs> I, I played that game for what two three years, and I was absolutely obsessed with it, um, and. The, just the the direction you can you can do anything in that game you can you can be good you can be bad you can work with people you don't have to work with anybody you can harass people you, you the, the the options are limitless and and it's just the fact that it mimics real life so perfectly is something that very few games can 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 uh can say and CCP did a phenomenal job and I know things have changed over over the course of the game and uh but but yeah it's yeah I'll, I'll live in that universe any day of the week all right josh what's your take well that's a tough question because unlike nick most games i play are probably i don't know if i'd really want to live in those environments <laughs> really, i mean i'm like if i would think of like the first game i've ever played and usually is in my top three games is resident evil i don't necessarily know if i want to live in <laughs> resident evil zombie <laughs> apocalypse um, yeah I guess if I thought about it right now, I, the first thing I, I guess would come up at the top of it, I'd love to live in the world of the Witcher world. I think that's a really crazy world. To, if I was a Witcher, of course, but... Um, you wouldn't want to be like a troll or something? Yeah. <laughs> I love that environment. Um, I just think it's really... It's a really great blend of fantasy and... History. And history, yeah, exactly. The other game I probably could think off the top of my head would probably be Mass Effect. I mean, who, I mean, it's, it's similar to the idea of what Nick was saying with, like, intergalactic space travel and, like, working with different species, and, um, except with, except with, you know, not, not as much addiction associated with it. But, <laughs> yeah, um, my, uh, my answer is similar to yours, Josh. I, I was actually going to say Mass Effect as well. Okay. And it's, it's really for the same reasons if it was a film or a TV show, I would choose Firefly or Battlestar Galactica because in my dream life scenario, I would love to be aboard a space vessel, venturing through space, discovering new species, learning about new planets, um, learning more about ourselves and just discovering space. You get to, you get to pilot to Normandy for the rest of your life? Yeah. How well, could you turn that down? Maybe I, I, yeah, I wouldn't complain about that. Even if I was on a... a a lowly space vessel that was just transporting cargo, I would take it. I would love to just live on a space vessel. So that would be my pick. Um, I will say that uh, the follow-up to the original Mass Effect trilogy is right around the corner, Mass Effect Andromeda, which actually covers the part of Mass Effect that I would love to live in, which is essentially when citizens of Earth first discovered the existence of other races in our universe and first discovered the mass so effect is, and it a pre, is it a prequel because i thought it wasn't a prequel it's not a prequel exactly it covers that part that i just talked about but the actual gameplay takes place actually simultaneously as the mass effect games but in a different galaxy in andromeda uh. so all the events don't connect at all to the to the main game so but it is about discovering yeah. new species and new planets and and uh figuring out where mankind fits in into the galaxy and the universe so yeah i'm pumped for that that's a good I, I like your guys's uh picks mass i think effect. we all kind of had similar yeah I, mass effect would definitely be number two for me if it wasn't for eve online so yeah yeah totally okay our next segment is every week uh we like to provide our listeners with a simple piece of advice that will help them with everyday things whether it be big or small and we call it our neat knowledge nibble <laughs> Wait, yes, yes, that's me this week. Uh, so, I just recently read an article about how 47% of Americans, if they were faced with a situation where they had to pay a bill of $400, they would not be able to pay it. And that really kind of inspired me for this week to delve into the financial realm uh, for this knee knowledge nibble and, and, and give the advice to say is to pay yourself first. Uh, it's really important that you know when 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 you're working is is to you get that paycheck take whatever amount that you can and just set it aside and and that's and that's paying yourself before you go out and uh, dispose of it and, ex and dispose of it spend yeah. it all on process spend it all yeah spend it all on uh, on <laughs> subscriptions to you online or whatever <laughs> no but, uh, but 
But I came across a really cool uh, government uh, sponsored option for saving solution. It's, it's uh, from my uh, ra.gov and it's basically a, it's, it's kind of a, it's a, it's based on like an IRA, an, an independent retirement account and it's completely free. It's the interest rates are very good, a lot, a lot higher than you'd get from a from a normal uh, savings account that you get from a bank. But you can automatically deposit money into it uh, right can, from your paycheck. Can anyone enroll? Anyone can. Anyone can enroll. If you're an American citizen, you have a social security number. Uh, you can enroll, and you can start saving money today, and you will save a lot more money than you would compared to a normal savings account. So, so yeah, that's really that's that's. I know it kind of delves from our, our our usual talks, but I think it's really important that that you uh, you have the ability to protect yourself if, if something uh, serious yep. comes up. So yeah. so yeah, myra.gov, and I do not work for the government. I just recently found out about this and started taking advantage of it myself. Uh, the only the only downside is you can only save up to an X number of dollars before you have to transfer that money into a different account. But but I just feel like. You had this this option available. Like, why would you not take advantage of it? So, so check it out. Well said. Great. Right. That covers our neat knowledge nibble of the week. So uh, uh, that brings us to the part of the podcast where we're starting to wrap things up. Are there any other lingering topics or anything else you guys like to address before we finish up here? I have one. If Nick doesn't have one, you know, I, my cousin just posted something online, and I thought I bought it. Uh, spread that knowledge to you guys. I don't know if you guys heard that San Francisco is now providing free college. So I think that's a good optimistic that's story. Cool. That's cool. That's yeah. awesome. That's news to me. Yeah. That's so, cool. I mean, hey, man, like, in, according to what Nick said, pay yourself first. Education is important for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. If you can invest in yourself, man, you're just, you're going to reap the benefits. It's yeah. awesome. So I just wanted to add that in. Yeah. I am looking forward to finishing Stranger Things. Uh, that's going to be my goal by the end of... <laughs> Tonight, tonight. tonight. Yeah. <laughs> after this podcast, I'm going straight home to finish it, and I'm not even kidding. Awesome. Uh, uh, really looking forward to be able to talk about it more in depth with you once you finish yes, it next week. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm going to watch the trailer for Stranger Things 2, and yeah. And I'm just going to recommend to both you guys and all of our listeners, watch Legion. Yes. Watch Legion. I, I, I would be shocked if you guys watched the first episode and didn't like it. It's excellent. Very impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So thank you for listening to episode two of our podcast. We air weekly every Monday morning, and you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, and pretty much every major podcast service out there. To contact us, you can send us an email at thedigitalrelics at gmail.com. Uh, we also have a Facebook page and a Twitter page, which we will be going live with uh, in the coming weeks. Um, throw us an email or send us a message. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, suggestions, and opinions. And thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.